Welcome to the RCA Executive Education Design for Good Academy second masterclass. I am Delfina Fantini van Dietmar. I am a biologist and I hold a practice-based PhD in design from the RCA. I'm currently working at the MA Fashion where there's a great interest in bringing regeneration as a fundamental paradigm to revision the discipline. Through new ways of relating, re-understanding our connection to nature, considering manufacturing processes and aesthetics, we see fashion as a transformative practice that can create healthier possibilities for our future, but also for other beings. Some questions we're interested in exploring are how can we connect with nature by approaching the meaning and qualities of layers that touch our body? How can fashion start addressing the toxicity of the supply chain and reconnect the soil and planet health through whole system approach? And also how can fashion contribute to the field by exploring sense-based values and new narratives. Today, I'm joined by Richard Atkinson, senior tutor at the MA Service Design. With over a decade of experience conducting ethnographic field studies in low-income communities in the Global South, Richard recently published When Communities Design Aid, a book that explored how design interventions truly use community ties concluded in participative development goals. Through practice-based design methodologies, Richard is currently exploring the future of indigenous pastoralist life in Kenya. This is in order to preserve indigenous pastoralist knowledge at risk of being lost, and also to help communities adapt their knowledge to new climatic conditions. Our masterclass guest today is Dr. Daniel Christian Val. Daniel holds a degree in biology, holistic science, and a PhD in design on human and planetary health. Daniel has been one of the catalysts of the regeneration movement and is the author of the book, Designing Regenerative Cultures. In 2021, Daniel received the RSA Bicentenary Medal for applying design in service to the society. Currently, he works as a consultant, educator, activist with NGOs, business, governments, and local change agents. Today, the conversation will be centered on regeneration and this paradigm's value for design. We will be discussing how design can create conditions conducting to life, and we will be delving into how regeneration can become integral to design practice. We will have a conversation lasting approximately 35 minutes, so please do add all of your questions in the Q&A chat box. We will try to get as most uh, as we can uh, response. Today, we have over 650 guests from over 63 countries joining us. And before we start, I will cover a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded. We will be able to share the link of the recording after the event. We do aim to have an interactive session, so we will invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A chat box. Please use the chat box if you have any technical difficulties. We do have a technical team behind to... Yeah help you solving any technical difficulties you might be experiencing. With all of that said, I would like to welcome Daniel to the RCA. Uh, today we have a very diverse audience. We have designers working at the Design for Good Alliance, RCA students, designers from all around the world, and also the general public. To start, Daniel, I would like you to introduce us to regeneration, and also if you can tell us a little bit more of how do you see this paradigm anchored to the fundamental process of life itself? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this series. And um, yeah, you already half answered my question with the second half of your question, because for me, it's very important, particularly at this point where suddenly a lot of people are using the adjective regenerative with whatever they're doing. Um, and there's a lot of talk about regeneration being the new sustainability and all these kind of trendy hyping something up kind of conversations. It's even more important to highlight that regeneration is not a concept, a new idea that you now need to study up on and then implement. Regeneration is fundamental to life's processes. Um, I had a wonderful conversation around about this time last year with Fritjof Kapra, which we entitled um, Regeneration, the Essence of Life's Capacity to Self-Organize. And in it, we dissect that the cutting edge of modern science basically describes that life organizes according to certain patterns and the pattern of regeneration, of being able to recreate and transform to respond to changing context and 
evolve from the inside out, which is what life as a planetary process does, is fundamental to life itself. And that in the next step means that we as human beings are not a cancer on the planet. We can behave like that sometimes. And in the last five to 8,000 years, some of us have started to behave like that maybe. But for the long journey of our human history, we were regenerative expressions of place, not owners of place. We lived in ecosystems as keystone species that made these places more biodiverse, more abundant, and more conducive to harbor more life because we knew that then our life would be more abundant. And so um, those two anchors, particularly in the face of what is currently popular to call the poly crisis or the meta crisis, are fundamental because it means that we are aligned with life itself and that we have it in our genes and in our ancestral indigenous lineages everywhere on the planet that we're capable of being healers of places and custodians of places. And that's ultimately what regenerative design and regenerative development is about. How do we become custodians of the places in which we dwell again and heal the damage that we've done over 200 years of industrialization? Thanks, Daniel. I think it's really nice what you said also in this kind of ecological language. We're keystone species that are able to be conducent to life. Mm -hmm. In one of our conversations, you mentioned David Ors, which I believe was one of your external examiners in your PhD, quoting humans as arrogant species that call themselves homo sapiens on a planet with a biosphere. This mm -hmm. takes us to the question, how do we fit humanity back into the biosphere cycles of nature? Which is the self-reflections designers should be having? And what could be the role of designers here if the narrative is reframed? And the, 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 that quote goes, um, the challenge of fitting a species arrogant enough to um, call itself homo sapiens into a planet where the biosphere is a de design challenge. And, and so um, for, for, he, he wrote this beautiful book. Um, it's called... Nah? So called the nature of design, um, highly highly recommended. Um, for for me, that really was the initial, like when when in two thousand and six, after David Orr it was my external examiner, I won a Scottish Ecological Design Association um, student travel award to go and visit him at Oberlin College in the U.S. and um, I did an interview with him then that is actually still on my YouTube channel. If you look Daniel Christian while YouTube, you can find it. And in that interview, I asked him about the dimension of the sacred and spirituality in the transition we now needed to make as a species to actually have a future. And in his answer, he really floored me because he, he said, um, among many other things, he basically said that, that before we can answer the questions of what we need to design and how we might design it in order to be more sustainable, we need to ask ourselves a much deeper question. Why are we worth sustaining as, a, as human beings? And that question brings us back into the conversation that we've lost with the kind of blinding of modernity and technological process that everywhere around the world our indigenous ancestors had a kin-centric world worldview meaning that life was family was relations we were in the web of life we were not separate from it now we have an oxford university dictionary that says that everything that is native like when you that defines nature in opposition to human it actually has at the end um, as opposed to human in the definition. So, so if we keep defining nature as a process out there and um, see ourselves as other, we will use it as a resource and we will try to overexploit it because we feel separate from it. If we don't come back into that kin-centric worldview, there's no chance that we will be able to redesign a fit between our species and the biosphere. And the challenge of regenerative design is really that this refitting 
cannot happen at the scale that we're currently trying to solve the poly crisis or the meta crisis. We have, like Sharm el Sheikh climate conference, the last one, 55,000 people descending on Sharm el Sheikh to have a conversation about solving the climate crisis about at a global scale. We need to flip it and fit ourselves back into places, meaning localities and regions, much smaller scale. And if we can fit every regional population back into their region in a way that heals that region, and we do that everywhere around the planet, then we can heal the planet. But we cannot heal the, the you can only, Bill Reed, one of the, the, the leaders of the Regenesis group, which has a long um, standing practice in regenerative development, he once said to me in a conversation, Daniel, you cannot save the planet, but you can save places. And the same is true. You cannot heal the planet, but you can heal places. And that's actually also what the Planetary Health Alliance said when they published the Planetary Health Report, more from a health policy perspective. They said, yes, we're talking about planetary health, but let's be very clear. The only way that we can implement that planetary health vision is by working at the ecosystem and bioregional scale. And so for me, that's why I have also the, the world's river systems behind me, because I think the, the the lost scale and design that we need to pay attention to to achieve this fitting back into the biosphere is to look at the bridging scale between ultra local and globalization, which is bioregional. Daniel, thank you. And um, I mean, you wrote one of the sort of early PhDs about design, and and yet your work is sort of both inside and outside design. Um, and I think what you've been describing is one sort of very fundamental challenge to the way we think about design is to be much more sort of place based and to be in a way much more cautious about thinking about the scale at which we operate. Um, as somebody who can, knows design but is looking at it from slightly outside of it, what would you say the other challenges note of fundamental ways that we think about design or the habits and practices and assumptions that within the design community we have? I can answer that question and at the same time answer also the question, what is different about sustainability and regeneration? Like maybe let me just briefly preface there that I, I'm not very happy with the current discourse that dismisses all the work in sustainability in favor of regeneration. Um, sustainability is an important goal that we haven't achieved yet. Um, it's an outcome. Regeneration is a process. And the two are related and mutually supporting, not, not in opposition to each other. But um, the tendency of designers has been to uh, even design schools, telling designers what their job is, has been to envision themselves to some extent as problem solvers. Um, and maybe part of this abstracting process of the global problem solving processes is also come into design that when we when we look at the world through problems we tend to um spend a lot of time bringing in insights from different disciplines which design is very good about i always say designers are djs they they, they steal things from all disciplines and mix it together to play a new tune um but the the the, the lens of problem solving brings with it the tendency to abstract the definitions of the problem and then the kind of the classic practice of let's have a design sprint or a hackathon and find solutions and then we pitch the best solutions to the investors and then the investors pick the best three solutions and then we put some money behind them and how do we scale it up and regeneration says no you can't work that way you have to work out of the uniqueness of place and culture and all what we call problems do show up when you give them specific context, a place and a culture within which you're working. But because they show up in a specific context, they show up with names and faces and real organizations and real ecosystems and real problems and real opportunities. And suddenly there's a sort of Kuhnian Gestalt switch. And what you're working with is potentiality, potential of that place rather than problem solving. So that's, for me, one thing that we need to get out of this designers as problem solvers um, mindset. And another that comes also with design quite often is, and it's part of our current culture, is that we have a very objectifying way of seeing the world. 
And designers tend to be object fanatics, like everybody has to do their chair and everybody has to do their lamp. And um, it's how do we re-envision the outcome of the design brief, whether it's an object or a process or urban neighborhood or the things that designers do. We're still doing that work. But how, if you're working regeneratively, you would do that work in a way where the entire process, starting from questioning the design brief, whether it's the right design brief, to involving everybody from the suppliers to the users to the client to the community that is touched by it, in the process of delivering the, uh, the supposed outcome, the object of design, but the real focus of regeneration is not that outcome. The real focus of regeneration is building the capacity for everybody that I just mentioned to understand the larger system the design is nested in, to like capacity meaning the capacity to hold more of the real world. And then at the same time, the capability to meaningfully interact and use and question that system that we're designing. So it's the, the deliverable becomes capability and capacity and not the object. You still deliver the object, but you deliver it in such a way that the people using it also have the capability of questioning it. Because one of the problems we have is that we we design the world and then, then uh, um, the world designs us or designs our worldview. There's a sort of loop um, that, that our designs go on designing. Um, as, as Tony Fry liked to say. And um, it's that Winston Churchill quote, first we design our uh, buildings and down, then our buildings design us um, or shape. We first, first we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. That's true for all of design and being more uh, and paying more attention to that means that we need to be able to question past design solutions more readily. And that only happens if we educate everybody to be involved in the design process. And it's 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 a radical departure in design schools because we like to kind of still hold this highly creative, genius designer individual high up as somebody who can then be a consultant to lowly people who don't know about design and, and aesthetics. And I, I think that that's dangerous. Design, and I mean, I'm talking to the converted, the way you're working is, is very much about participatory design with communities in place um that's that's i think where where we need to go and but you mentioned um indigenous knowledge and indigenous communities and, and in the last talk um uh there was with don norman there was quite a lot of mention of indigenous knowledge being something that um design for good was interested in i mean i think that's something you thought about quite a lot Daniel. in terms of maybe the differences in an and obviously, uh, I don't want to sort of, sort of lean to generalizing a little bit, you know, not all indigenous cultures are the same, but in terms of the way that we might sort of think differently about our own knowledge and our own ways of, of making and, and, and knowing, what, what do you take from your sort of um, work looking at indigenous cultures and indigenous knowledge? Well, I think indigenous cultures can take us, uh, tell us a lot about design ethics. Um, mm -hmm. And also about aesthetics. Um, there's there's a beautiful um, like the, the, which tribe is it again? I mentioned it in my book. It's it's one of the um, Native American um, North American tribes um, call their way the beauty way, and they have this saying of if you walk into the future, walk in beauty. Um, I actually cited in the in the original language in, in my book and and for me that kind of um attitude of understanding that we are in reciprocal kin relationship with the world and that um like buckminster fuller apparently also said like it um if a design isn't beautiful no i don't know actually i don't know who, who said it but basically um i'd say jay Harmon, the the founder of Pax Scientifica, who was a boat designer. And, and he, he said when he designs boats, um, first he designs them with all sorts of technical equipment. But if in the end it's not beautiful, he knows that the shape is like it, it's not a good boat. Um, so the, it's this, this guidance of a deeper natural aesthetic that we can reconnect with, I think, um, 
indigenous cultures had everywhere, but much deeper than that, it's this, you design differently if you design to support not just the human client or you, yourself, but you design to support the community and you design to support life. There's a there's a sort of tri ethica that you can find in different expressions in almost every indigenous teaching around the planet that is basically saying the, the famous seventh generation of the Iroquois nation, like the always consider any major decision through three lenses, three questions. Does it serve myself? Does it serve my community? And does it serve life? And you have to find at least two, if not three good answers for all three levels. Imagine how that would revolutionize design if we asked ourselves those three questions that every time. Does it not just serve the immediately involved in the design? Does it really serve the human community? And does it really serve life as a whole? And to understand that if we cannot find two good answers at least on all three levels, then there's something wrong with the design. It's it's lacking um, viability. And um, for me, that's that's more important than that. There's a at the moment there's a trendiness to go back to sort of bowing to indigenous um, as if as other. I think, just as I said in the beginning. Collectively, as the human species, we need to remember that we are indigenous to life, that we are a regenerative keystone species of which a dominant proportion has lost its way for a few hundred and a few thousand years and has had disproportionate impact to the detriment of all the others that haven't lost their way, which are still out there, indigenous cultures caring for the biodiversity hotspots of the planet. So it's it's a it's not a going back to a golden past. It's going forward to um, bringing these ethics and this kin-centric world worldview back into design, and then using the power of design and technology, but not with a because we can do it, we will do it attitude of technology, but with a wisdom of saying what kind of technologies to what extent would really help us to re-inhabit the planet in a regenerative way. So we, within the lifetime of generations alive today, redesign the human impact from being predominantly degenerative and exploitative and extractive to being regenerative, nourishing and healing. That's, I think, the, the grand challenge of design for the 21st century. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I'm also very interested in addressing, Daniel, your views on SDGs. I'm a big fan of your expression, doing Aikido with SDGs. Mm -hmm. What is your view on the current SDGs framework? And again, coming back to this regeneration and the need for unsiloed integrative approaches. Mm -hmm. What is missing? What is needed? And also, I am very aware that you have released some SDG cards. So if you can tell us more about them, that would be great. So I, I um, for a long time, worked with an organization called Guy Education. I still work with them. Um, and uh, it's an educational organization, an NGO that grew out of the Global Eco-Village Network. And the Global Eco-Village Network is a ECOSOC NGO to the United Nations, meaning that it's part of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. And um, through that, we've been involved with the UN process on the, the change of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And immediately after they came out in 2015, I was asked to design a set of teaching materials and a one-day workshop that would engage people with the SDGs at a community scale. And... Why do I say Aikido with the SDGs? Because um, the SDGs have been co-opted to some extent, and particularly the focus on the um, next layer down, the not the goals, but all the whatever they, they call it, outcomes. Um, they have created a huge focus on reporting, and we've wasted a good part of the decade of implementing them on 
city reports, national reports, mm. bureaucracy, instead of engaging with communities on the ground and saying, how are these goals meaningful to you? And then maybe stepping a little bit further back, um, there's a Trojan horse in the SDGs, which is SDG number eight, that continues to predicate the growth imperative that if economies don't grow, they collapse and we must grow at all costs. So this decent work and economic growth, we need to question because it it's this growth imperative that is measured in GDP that is part of the degenerative process that makes us not fit into a planet with a biosphere. And so um, when I got a chance to do this work, I decided I'm going to create a set of cards that uses the four-dimensional curriculum that all of the uh, guy education's material is based on, which was radical at the time when it was launched in 2005 because it amplified the, the three-legged stool or the three pillars of sustainability, which are often called social, ecological, and economic, with a fourth one that was called worldview, which was also bringing in perspectives of the sacred, spirituality, other peer, like indigenous worldviews, and it was particularly making people aware that it's our worldview that influences how we design answers to social, ecological, and economic problems. And the other um, kind of um, radical thing is that the integration of those four dimensions in Gaia education is always through design. So it's very relevant to, to our conversation here. And what we did with the cards is every single SDG is looked at through the four dimensions. So you can already have a much more holistic, systemic understanding of each one of the SDGs. And then there's a little bit of text about those four dimensions and that SDG. And then there's a series of questions that people can ask themselves that all have the structure of saying, ah, that's good. There's a global goal here from the United Nations. How is that meaningful in our community? What is already going on in our community that might not play to SDG number three, but is actually working towards it. And how do we integrate all those 17 goals through the power of place in this place, in this community, in this bioregion? And um, to my surprise, the, the UNESCO said it's the best material that they've come across for the SDGs and funded the translation of the material. Uh, unfortunately, it was still the better version that I would have liked to improve a little bit but um we just rushed ahead with it and um the cards are out in russian and chinese in um in arabic uh, in french in spanish uh, in english and german and um they still have that potential of doing aikido with the sdgs of making them relevant to local people um and they possibly even have the potential of healing people's relationship with the SDG because the world's split now over whether they actually want the UN process or not. And understandably, because post the Bretton Woods meetings, the architecture of globalization was built with the World Bank, the IMF, and the United Nations. And that whole development agenda of the United Nations divided the world into developed nations and underdeveloped nations and created a real havoc on, on the self-worth of people in the global south and, and created, um, actually perpetuated the structural violence that was still in the system from colonial times. So, so there's a lot now that we are having these conversations about decolonialization and all of that. Um, a lot of housekeeping needs to be done within the UN to, we need the UN, we need a gremium of, of humanity talking with each other about the future of humanity. But um, for me, these, these SDG cards are a way of bringing community into that, communities into that conversation, address the critical side of things, but not dismiss it in a sort of activist stance of stop, but say, okay, if everybody wants to talk SDGs now, how do we do Aikido with it? How do we talk to our national governments and say, we're doing it. We've done it all, all this time. Our local organizations are actually caring about 
literacy and um, supply of clean water and supply of renewable energy and all of those things. So support us for it. So you 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 almost use it as the platform of conversation in which you can make that shift from the the sort of sustainability conversation to the regeneration conversation, um, bringing it back into place, bringing it back into place sourced application in the specific of place and people. That's that's really interesting, and I think so. One of the one of the things that we're probably involved in more within the college, but also sort of seeing happening in design practice as well, is is an idea around sort of um, I guess design futures. And my colleague Nicholas Pereira this morning was talking about there's a kind of paradox there, and that design is always thinking about the future. But there is this sort of quite formal or it's a growing uh, response of, of, of thinking about sort of how do we predict and speculate and anticipate certain features and then you know methods for sort of backcasting from, from that. And I think one of the challenges that there's a growing number of people say within the college who are working in, in different settings around the world is you might be working in communities where actually tradition and cycles is is much more important, much more embedded. People are much more concerned with how do they maintain ways of life that have been um, with them for a long time rather than looking at changing things and where there aren't these ideas about accumulation and sort of building up of, of, of stocks or innovation. So a lot of the ideas that we might have in terms of, you know, how do, what is the future? How do you imagine the future? How do you work on the future? Um, seem problematic. I, I wonder what advice you'd have for, given there's a bit of a turn within design towards this sort of futures method. Um, from your own point, you respond to that. I, I had a very stark experience with that um a few years back when i worked with at the, at the time that was before the the famous museum of the future was finished in dubai the, the, the amazing ring based structure um in the run up to that the museum of the future already existed as a sort of pop up event that happened um once a year um at the same time as the dubai world government summit and um it was basically a very elitist uh, exhibition that the, the top world leaders plus the top layers of Dubai society accessed for two weeks and then had had a serious budget. And um, I was invited to be part of the design team to conceive one of those exhibitions. And the core pattern of how we work designally with the future was kind of exhibited there, which is you imagine a future and then you create a sort of vignette of that future with a product design that that kind of is touchable and a, you create a mock-up of something that we will have, a gadget that we will have in 30 years' time. And I think that that kind of working with the future is actually incredibly dangerous because particularly in this concept, I mean, imagine you, you make a vision of the future touchable to world leaders who don't have a lot of time to really go into depth, but think that when it's so well presented, this must be where things are going. So you're actually really affecting the future possibilities that people hold in their mind. And um, my, like to, to come back from at future from a different angle, um, in the in the activist movement, like the the notion of that we're in transition from one system to another has been around for the last 20, 30 years, like um but even longer, like with Schumacher's Small is Beautiful and so on, critiquing the growth system while it was taking off. But then um David Corton with um his his work and Joanna Macy with her work also talked about the great transition or the great turning to, from a industrial um military complex society to a life-sustaining society. And that notion of transition is again a notion of we're not enough right now here and we need to create a better future there. And then normally we go about it by creating a future blue sky event, describe that future, and then we do a backcasting into the different decades. And then we sort of say, okay, to create that future, we have to take these steps. Or we do scenario planning and we create four different scenarios of the future and we sort of navigate with each one of them informing us as life unfolds. Um, all of that 
puts the future into the future and somehow also our agency to make a difference into the future but our agency to make a difference is never anywhere but the present so how would we design if we designed with the future potential of the present moment in mind this is a term that i learned from one of my mentors tony hodgson from the international futures forum the future potential of the present moment and that's again very relevant to the conversation about regenerative cultures because people have misunderstood the meme of regenerative culture yet again as one new thing oh yeah we do need some of that because we're not um and so let's how do we do a few future forecasting event to to create regenerative cultures and i think the working with regeneration is always about working what is latent in place in people in culture and you start the work with regenerative cultures not by creating three flagship projects five years down the line that you look for funding for now you start by choosing a place a, a context a specific place or bioregion and then you look at where are the embers of life's regenerative capacity to self-organize coming through us in all walks of life anybody who cares shares, cooperates, nurtures, heals, restores, regenerates, is in service to a larger social, ecological, or even local economy whole, in service to others, is actually exhibiting regeneration as life. They're human beings, they're part of life, and they're exhibiting that pattern. And so you, when you work with regeneration, you try to make that system more visible to itself. You try to increase the quality of relationships between these separate actors in our kind of atomized society. And you begin to create a narrative where all these people who might just, some of them might be caring for single moms, and some of them might be caring for teenagers that need that had problems with the law. Others might be caring for the local badgers that they don't die out. And the next person might be passionate about trees and, and old trees in the neighborhood. But they're all sharing, caring, protecting. And they need to see that they're actually part of a impulse that is manifesting the real potential of that place and then and, and if we start fanning the embers giving oxygen to the the, the, the embers of regenerations that are even in the most deprived and uh, communities around the world then we work with the future potential of the present moment because we work with what's already there rather than blingy um vignettes with lots of money giving us an idea of some kind of always technological future because the whole idea of doing vignettes of the future, you can only really tell them with a little gimmicky product. If you try to create whole systemic new scenarios of how the world might look, um, it becomes too complex for that kind of way of working with the future. And so um, it, it predisposes us yet again to this techno-obsessed solutioneering instead of understanding that actually most of the solutions to heal the planet and ourselves are in relationships to among human beings, relationships to the more than human world and um, relationships to the wider community of life. And um, if we work on those, we, we actually will see that we might need less technology and a more wise use of technology, not ubiquitous technology and more AI and more um, chat GBT and all of that. Um, it it takes us away. It's yet again, it's, it, it's part of that process of abstraction that is actually creating a lot of the kind of epidemic of mental illness and, and all of that. Um, we, we need to not dismiss any of these technologies, but stop being so obsessed that everything needs to be a technological solution. And and I think when we work with the future in a different way in the present, we can shift the focus of design more towards relationships and less towards technology. That's interesting. And um, I think we need to move on to 
questions in a second. I mean, just as a reflection as well, I think one thing that, that I struggle with, and I, I think other, other colleagues who've been doing sort of futures work with communities who are facing real risks is that the stakes are in, incredibly high. And I think quite a lot of the time, some of the futures work that we might do can be quite abstract and sort of quite safe for us because we might be doing it for, you know, for a company, we might be doing it um, on a problem that won't necessarily have a, an existential risk to us. But I think, you know, some of the work that I'm seeing around the college, including the stuff we're doing in, in Kenya, is, is asking people to confront futures where the way they have been living for a long time may no longer be tenable. Um, and so I think that's a responsibility for sort of how do you how do you how do you imagine futures or how do you sort of treat the future when when the stakes are so high is something that um i i, I think we need to, to think about a lot, a lot more it's, it's certainly something that's very concerning for me. i would say clearly in the global south there are more people feeling the impacts already and they have felt them for a long time but um the stakes are high for all of us everywhere now um, so there is a real another question behind all of this, which is rather than rushing in with an even, ever, ever bigger team of designers and engineers in the kind of solutioneering attitude of saying, we've got a meta crisis and a massive problem. Let's solve it. We, we know how to do it. Uh, technology will help us. Um, maybe we actually, because of that urgency, really would be better advised to step back like in the in the kind of napoleon's famous quote of waterloo dress me slowly i'm in a hurry like when you're just about to go into the decisive battle is a bad analogy for what we're trying to do um decision for the future of humanity you you don't want your you, problems with your clothes like so you basically what i'm trying to say is um at this point we might be well advised to take time for unlearning and really asking question about our patterns of thinking or organizing ideas, the meta design behind how we design the worldview, the, the, the scaffolding that allows us, how, how do we, like if we see the world through problems or crises that need solving, or we see the um, world through manifesting potential in a particular place shifts it a lot. If we see the world through a story of separation that separates um, self from world, humanity from nature, um, science and art into sort of polar opposites rather than sees that they're all related, um, we will design differently. If we live in a story of interbeing, of kinship, of kin-centric worldview, and and so for, for me, I think the part with this urgency comes this, how do we stop for long enough to really fundamentally um, question our patterns mm -hmm. and find new future pathways from a deep reflection of what we need to unlearn before we go there. And the, the, the problem right now, it's the same also within regeneration that more and more people are jumping onto that bandwagon and doing what they did before, but now they're calling it regeneration. That's sort of muddying the water. People don't take the time to say, okay, well, like they, it's much easier to say, ah, oh, yeah, that's what it is. I've been doing that all along and just continue to doing what you're doing than to say, oh, well, maybe there's something deeper behind that that I need to spend some time reflecting on before I call myself a regenerative this, that, and the other designer. Um, so yeah, it's, um, and, and of course, the issue of designing for those who most need it um, is massive. Like the whole ecosystems regeneration and restoration movement um, should and is to some extent focused on first responses in in the areas that are most hit by climate change and actually building community resilience with the communities and and starting these conversations it's it's already happening i mean i think your work in kenya is part of that and and I, there's there's there i know of a lot of organizations um that are basically 
bringing regenerative agriculture, regenerative agroforestry, regreening of landscapes, rehydrating <clears throat> of landscapes or water management plants um, through to Africa and Asia through um, aid funding, because that's the way we can also stop the migration flows. If we if we can he help people to heal the ecosystems they live in, they have less environmental pressure to leave them. And, and the Great Wall of Africa project, for example, is, is part of that. All of that is also design. Sometimes designers are overly um, confident, I think, in the, in the architecture and product design space. Um, but then... At the same time, they don't see that, to my mind, design with a big D um, has to do with this core question that we've discussed this uh, today. How do we fit our species back onto a planet with a biosphere? These patterns behind me are the river patterns. That's a biophysical reality of planet Earth. What we've got in our minds, these straight lines, are drawn by the rulers of rulers in the era of power over and degeneration. They... We, to refit ourselves back in, we might even have to reconsider what the point of a nation state is that carries within it the them against us energy. Um, but that's maybe another webinar. <laughs> it's also an answer to one of the questions in the chat, which is great. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I'm to hear some questions. What, what if people? Like, it's a shame that we can't see the people that are listening to us because it's always a bit. Um, I like audiences. Well, we have a very active Q and A, so I will start with one question that somehow relates to radical hope, which is, I think, fundamental for designers that want to be engaged with uh, regeneration. This is coming from Carrie Norton. And the question is, what is your greatest wish for the possibility of evolving the UN SDG process through a regenerative design lens? Oof. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the one thing that, that we've, like, as I said it earlier, like we, this, this obsession with reporting comes from the worldview of separation. It's only when you work through, look at the world through the lens of statistics and quantifiable data and analysis with algorithms and big data that, that you get obsessed with measure, measuring impact in that statistical way. And that's part of what has slowed down the implementation process of the SDGs at the community level um, because everybody is just trying to report of where they stand. And it, it's, it's all with a finger in the air it's not it's not really relevant but if we could switch it to focusing on community-based implementation and resourcing communities in place to build the resilience that they now need with the disruptions that are likely to come in the next decades um that would do a lot and um with it it need, needs what SDG 17 was supposed to do in terms of the collaboration to bring them all together and not see them as 17 separate goals. Um, we also need to foreground. There's a wonderful conversation again with, with Fritjof Kapra that I did a few years back on the SDGs, which is calling for a more systemic approach to the SDGs. Because what, what has actually happened when you look at the national reports is that you get like whatever, Uganda reporting on national progress on the SDGs. And they're saying, we have decided that for Uganda, SDG number eight and three or four others are the most important. And this is how we're reporting. Um, so they're reporting on economic progress in the growth paradigm framing. And by trying to show improvements in that, they're actually creating policies that make like things worse in all the other areas of the SDGs. And so uh, I guess the, the 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 core thing to make differently is always integrate all of them, even if it is a complex conversation. And the only way you can make that conversation less complex is by giving it a specificity of place or region, because then the complexity is reduced by working with a real specific scenario. Um, and that, that would make a massive difference. Um, and it's, there, there is a bit of a danger that because people got disheartened with the SDGs, 
this initiative of the IDGs is now putting the attention yet again on the individual, on the inner, which is lovely. We need to bring more of the inner dimension into the, the conversation around sustainability. But it's a cloud and smoke initiative of yet again, like we did in the 90s, change your light bulb, recycle, do this. It's all your behavioral change that will save the planet. Now it's you need to meditate and change your worldview to save the planet. Yes, maybe, but we also need to talk about the structural violence in the system and the fact that we can pinpoint most of the carbon emissions to 50, 60 companies on the planet. And that's not going to change if we all start UN-informed inner development goals, meditation courses. We actually need to address the structural violence in the system and and, and the um, growth paradigm um, in our economic system to solve that. Thanks, Daniel. The next question is from an anonymous attendee, and is how do we bring regeneration into more conservative organizations? What could be a start point for all of us, perhaps participants that are actually now based in big corporations? Well. More, I'm not quite sure where the question is coming from because of the last bit of um, like if we're just talking about corporations or traditional organizations. I mean, traditional organizations are the church and governments and um, number of like farming associations are traditional. And the answer to that part of the question would be, again, if you it's not regeneration if it's not based in place and culture. So that's one litmus test for regeneration. And if you connect with people over their shared love for place, you can normally find that the traditional people, like farmers being very, very traditional, um, are actually still holding that shared love for place. Very often it's the conservative part of society that holds part of the cultural heritage connection as well. And so picking people up in in that sort of higher ground where beyond the political party divide what unites them is they actually have a lineage into and a care for the place that they're dwelling in that can open up doors to otherwise conversation like, like organizations that that might not immediately connect with the the conversation and with regard to large corporates, um, I think many of them are too big not to fail for the world that's coming towards us. And many of them are already starting to understand the decentralized manufacturing and the, the re-regionalization of production and consumption is actually a survival strategy for them in a new planet where environmental disruption and political disruption and now power block politics and war um, could potentially disrupt what was so lucrative biz business in the in the 90s and, and noughties. And um, I, I see that beginning to happen. This this um, kind of, in, in, in the biomimicry world, we, we call it the gen genotype phenotype exercise, where large corporations actually dare to look at what are we good at? What is the human potential in what our multinational is good at our what have we done but not in terms of what is our core business but is what we're capable of doing and how would we then take those capabilities and put them in, into service at the bioregional scale towards regeneration so it's not a what does this regeneration thing do for my business or my corporation it's a complete redesigning of the corporation of how can we be part of this fundamental redesign of the human impact on earth and that for me very often means that there is a value in the internationality of these com um, larger corporations and if we could support the devolution towards deeply rooted regional commitment of these corporations and then use their capacity to connect different bio regions into a network that supports the the kind of resource and material and technology flows that will still be needed at the global scale to enable this regional production for consumption then i think 
those corporations will find a new role in the future that that reinvent themselves sort of as subsid subsidiary organizations to bioregional production and consumption um, patterns and global knowledge exchange and global enabling the, the, the exchange of enabling technologies um, because we it's not a radical supplying everything within the circular economy of a bioregion. It might be 80% coming with uh, out of a bioregion, but the 20% that still need to be traded globally will enable the 20% production um, at the uh, regional scale. So, that, so that that's where I think that that corporations um, can be introduced to this conversation almost like a risk management stra uh, strategy, and also in that. Um, finding new ways of engaging with regions. Ultimately, there can be a um, transformation of the corporate structure towards um, cooperative business models or um, employee-shared business models. And all of that would, would basically slowly transform what we still think of when we say corporation, which is the, the, the monsters created in the 80s and 90s or before that, uh, and um, bring them into... In, in, a way that they also can be part of regenerating um, the human presence on Earth. Thanks, Daniel. There's a really good question here. It's how to design for with non-human actors or more than humans? Hmm. Well, that's really at the core of where, where we started, that um, we have deep, scientific knowledge about change processes in complex dynamic system and the so-called so socio-ecological systems, the whole study of resilient science over the last 30, 40 years. We, we've, we, we've done a lot of work on the core patterns behind ecosystems, um, the core patterns of designing life's design principles, the work of the Biomimicry Institute. And so um, one way of working with life and for life is to align our design patterns with those patterns that we studied. And now some people might say, yeah, but that's not working with nature. But then I would say um, that response comes from the dualistic worldview that others nature as non-human. If we're actually part of the system, then indigenous knowledge and our knowledge about nature and we ourselves are also nature. Like, so working with ourselves and our understanding, deep understanding that we have of natural patterns, which we just have ignored for so long because they weren't fitting the kind of quick um, object design focused, um, let's design more to increase um, consumption uh, kind of pattern. We need to come back to deeply designing within life's patterns. But then there are also many, many other ways of um, informing our, a more fitting design within place that anything from 24 hour solos in the wild nature of the place where you're trying to de de design in, or even an, an ecological understanding of that place with a guided um, tour, Look, looking at the species of that place, how they have designed to fit into that place. All of that can can inform us. And, and on a more profound inner level, the work of Joanna Macy and the so-called work that reconnects um, is, is all about processes that can um, help us to deconstruct this cultural pattern that we have, this meta design that we have, that, that actually makes us feel separate from the more than human world or nature as other. Um, the German poet scientist uh, Goethe uh, famously said, he who doesn't see nature everywhere sees her nowhere in the right light. So um, that's a really interesting sentence to meditate on um, with regard to that question. Thank you. An excellent question we have is from Monica Buchan. What gives you hope? life, life itself. When I look out in, into my regenerative food forest just over there, 
um, that I planted over the last three years and see how um, just with a little bit of care to that place, um, life just is on our side. Like that's where the magic can happen. Um, if we support it and somewhat get out of the way of the magic of um, natural processes of regeneration, um, so much can happen really quickly. Um, I, I also feel that... <sighs> It's a, it's a tricky thing, hope, because hope, if it is a sort of passive hope for a better future, um, I think it's quite dangerous. Um, again, coming back to one of my mentors, David Orr, we mentioned him earlier, um, he in one of his essays calls hope a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And I think that's a really way, a beautiful way of describing hope. Um, it's... Uh, says that it's an it's an action and it's all hands on deck time now for humanity and it's it's a form of active hope and another quote on, on hope that i really love um i don't think i can um memorize it completely but Václav havel said hope is not about um doing things because you know they're going to turn out right um hope is about doing things because you know the, the right things to do, no matter how things will turn out. And um, that's a powerful sentence that with what we've got coming at us, which is going to be nothing but the collapse of um, business as usual, um, we will need that kind of hope. Thank you. Richard, would you like to perhaps ask a few last questions? I mean, I was tempted to say we're not going to end on a better note than that, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've not been as uh, scrupulous about going through the questions. And there's one that sort of definitely talks to me, but I'll, I'll ask it of Daniel as well, which is um, from Emily O'Connor saying, um, I think it talk, um, how do we bring indigenous knowledge um, more into design without exploiting the communities and just using their knowledge without giving non credit recognition or fully involving them in the conversation. Why, why don't you say a little bit to that before I add? Because you 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 have that question with your work in Kenya, no? Yeah, I mean, and I think that it jumps out because it's a question that I think we're struggling with every day that we work on the project. I mean, my, my sort of response would be, I think the starting point for a project really matters. So in the one that we're doing, it came from... Um, from somebody who I'd worked with for a long time who, who'd moved, uh, he's called uh, Javi Morungi, he's sort of um, worked in various sort of uh, academic posts, but also research in, in different parts of East Africa and South Africa. But he had moved from Nairobi to an area where he could see the desert coming to his his land. Um, and the brief, as it is, sort of came from his experience of that place and from talking to him in the community and sort of seeing it with his own eyes. And I think I'd been sort of very nervous about taking on a project without it coming from somebody who understood the the, the, the place. Um, I think the the other thing that we're sort of trying to do is unlearn, as, as Daniel was talking about, and um, simple questions like, you know, we're interested in the future, but how do people see the future? Is it more cyclical? Um, what are the sort of, if, if we have ideas of designing for the future, what are the everyday sort of heuristic ways that people might think about it there? Um, and then, designing everything right from the start of the process even you know what what is the brief rather than saying we, we have the brief the very first things we did was just go and listen and talk to people and then do some exercises where we were trying to write a, a brief for a project with different groups of people in, in different places um and then I, I think the last thing is um just being aware that there are there are going to be sort of differences within communities as well it's interesting we talked about the sdg and you know sort of number four i think is is, is about quality education but a very live conversation in, in the communities where we've been working is a lot of young people are going to school and they're getting a sort of more formal education but they're spending a lot less time with their families and looking after animals or being in in in, in the the pastoralist practice which is traditional there and so then one kind of education on on, on a certain measure is is you know absolutely rocketing and, and doing lots of things for for, for the sort of measurement of, of that particular sdg but at the same time other forms of education are potentially being lost and there's quite a lot of worry about that mm. so i think 
where you see, I think that kind of conflict between different aims is is sort of endemic to this this kind of work. And my perspective is always that you have to find ways of giving the sort of final voice to the community. You you can't weigh that kind of question yourself. Um, but you do need to have different ways of thinking ethically as well. I mean, it's interesting. Design for good is like you know what is our notion of of good? And I think in design we you know, design ethics is a very live topic, but I'm not sure the conversation around things is often, you know, quite utilitarian. We don't necessarily look at different ways of thinking about ethics. So I think that's the other sort of um, aspect to, to sort of working in that kind of environment that I'm finding useful is to, is to talk to people who have different ethical perspectives and to try to, to sort of shape what, what different versions of, of good might be. Yeah, I mean, the, the, for me, the, the, the short answer to the question is, is somehow... Um with deep respect and on eye level um, in full recognition of both what they might still be holding in terms of deep knowledge of that place, but also in recognition of the, the effects of colonialism and, and 500 years in some places of, um, of, of oppression. Um, and at the same time, I think always with that bridge that I tried to make at the very beginning of understanding ourselves as indigenous to life, because I think the big problem that we're building up right now is that it's becoming fashionable to work with indigenous people, but then we almost sort of see them yet again as an, an other and, 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 and we sort of create this dynamic again of I mean, even in some indigenous communities, you can get sounds, okay, you've been oppressing us for 500 years, now you shut up for 500 years. And that obviously isn't, isn't the way we're going to find a, a, a way forward together. So I, I think um, reminding, and normally you can find in the wise elders of indigenous communities, that I've never not found agreement to that statement, aren't we all indigenous to life? Um, and so I think working with indigenous wisdom is respectfully and finding that higher ground where we remember that we're kin. And that's where I believe also you can connect with them again in a deeper way. If if you if you recognize we're the younger brothers, as the Kogis like to call us, uh, um, we're, we're just still learning how to fit into a planet with a biosphere. They learned that many, many generations ago. Thanks so much, Dalian and also Richard for the insightful conversation and also for this yeah, impulse of a radical departure for design much more based on place, life, and also yeah, biocultures. We have to now come to a closure. Uh, please uh, keep your eyes open to the new dates of our third uh, masterclass of the Design for Good Academy. It will be announced very soon. And yes, we... We look forward to keep expanding these conversations. They're all super relevant topic. Design has a lot to do. So yeah, we hope that at least on our front, we keep expanding this. We don't have an answer. There's no a protocol as this complexity tell us. Uh, but yeah, thanks to this conversation, I think we have yeah some clear guidance of how regeneration has to really be based in place with specific cultures. And that, as you said, Daniel, for people perhaps engaging with big problems or in big organizations is a perfect departure point. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah,